element. They were discussing um, how much their profit was going to be per scoop. What's your profit going to be per quart? What's it going to be per gallon? And they had to present all of this to these business owners where, you know, those kids are making that real life impact in the decision um, for them and how much money they're going to make off of a gallon of ice cream. So they ended up running like eight or nine of um, days in December for the three flavors that actually won. So uh, never have I, those of us who, um, you know, are lucky to have a credit card for work. Uh, I was probably one of the only people who's gone and purchased $400 worth of ice cream at one time as I bought ice cream for the entire school as we were celebrating the launch of um, one of their flavors when it ran. So super cool opportunity. Um, again, uh, for, um, for introductions, um, I'm the coordinator of elementary instruction, the West House, West Milwaukee School District. I also get the opportunity to coach um, project-based learning K-12 in our schools. So um, I have tons of different examples. I help, I'll co-teach, I go and plan with people. I teach our micro-credentials and professional development um, around project-based learning, around the use of curriculars and other resources like Define Learning um, to, to achieve those goals. I've been a principal in my past, AP, Dean of Students. Um, and really my, my, I think of my role is very student facing. Um, and I try to create these experiences for students. So if you think about a good driving question for project-based learning, my driving question for this school year is how do I create infinite learning opportunities for students? That's guiding like almost all of my work every day as um, I'm working with teachers. So, you know, I just talked about PBL. It's not the extra thing. It is the thing. So work on you know, having those um, those resources that you've adopted, your core curricular resources in partnership with something like Define Learning to make sure that you're hitting at that through, we're teaching PBL through the standards, not as that additional extra thing. So a lot of questions that um, I like to reflectively ask people as I'm, as I'm working with them is creating these certain conditions. So these are usually our first steps when I'm working with new teachers. Um, and where are those small steps that students or that teachers can take impacting the student experience that don't feel like a big lift where they have to come up with like this six to eight week project. Um, so we talk about this idea of how can we make learning public? How are we bringing in authentic audiences and community partnerships um, it, so that students are presenting their learning to um, this authentic audience? How is learning iterative? How are we building multiple opportunities for students to get feedback? How are we having them be iterative and that share that learning with their peers? It might be peer-to-peer -peer feedback. It might be feedback from a teacher. I get to travel around all the time um, as a district administrator and give feedback to kiddos um, on their projects. So talking about making that learning iterative, super important. Also a very easy step for a teacher to kind of really create what we often call like micro PBLs. Um, how are we gonna make their curricular experience and their experience with us every day? How do we make that impactful on their lives? I'm gonna talk about, uh, we. Uh, Mary, Cindy, and I were Zooming yesterday, and I had just come from a project launch that I'm going to talk about um, around some food trucks, but it was like those kids were, like, that was impactful. They all went home yesterday, and they talked about that with their families. I can almost guarantee it. Um, and how are students being reflective on not only the product, but also the process? So thinking about the idea of having students being able to explain how they got to that end product is super important for kids. And then how do we co-create with students? So how are we bringing students to the table um, in order to talk about what they're gonna learn? So um, one of our, our product launches that, or project launches that we just did yesterday, um, working with a, third, a group of third grade teachers at one of our elementary schools, and they are doing um, a Define Learning inspired food truck frenzy. Um, so they had five food trucks yesterday that came at different times um, all throughout the day and all of the owners were there and some of the chefs were there from these different companies. And they all kind of did these interviews. First, they kind of talked about like, this is what it's like owning a food truck. This is our, our struggles and things like that. 
You can see some, um, this was Tots on the Street. Those of you who are from the Wisconsin area, you might know them because they're in Sundex and they'll also be at Pfizer next year. So they were super excited about their growth model for their business. Um, we had Press Waffles who was there. So um, they brought their food truck right in the parking lot and um, the kids were able to check that out. So I just grabbed like some, I hope this plays right. Yeah, so I just was having this in the background. So when I'm looking at like food truck entrepreneur in Define Learning, we're taking some of the rubrics out of there and we're looking at some of those pieces of like, what questions could we ask an entrepreneur? How do they design their menu? How do they, how do they design their social media page? What really captures um, their learning? And it has rubrics already built in right here. So then the teachers are focusing on some of the other pieces than um, you know, having to worry about how they're gonna score them. So that's been a great partnership for us. When we talk about um, making learning public, this was one of our exhibitions of learning last year with our Deeper Learning Virtual Academy, which is a virtual um, project-based learning school. They were using um, photography to tell stories. So we rented out a space and each student had a storyboard of their photography. Um, of, they might've taken pictures of the different schools that they've been to over the years. They might've taken pictures of their family, but they were all using uh, photography and narrative writing to tell their story of their life. This is a senior, um, Jay Kwan, who was with us. Um, super, I think about the smile on his face versus when he's presenting his entire life through a narrative story and through pictures versus him getting, you know, an A on a test that might not even make it home because it's ending up in the garbage can by the time they leave that 50 minute class. Um, so again, this is where you, when we do these exhibitions of learning, we see parents, we see grandparents, we see neighbors, we see families, little brothers and sisters. They're all excited about this space and it's all about the student learning. So how we typically structure these is um, every student gets their own space. We do these in all, as I go through pictures here, you're gonna see these. Um, this is one of our strategic plan goals as our entire district is every student presents their learning to a authentic audience. And like I said, it could be grandma and grandpa, it could be a teacher, it could be, you know, principal, any number of people. And as we're, we've kind of iterated, we now have like a feedback tool for guests. So we have the, um, our parents write feedback for students. We give them question starters um, so they can leave a pro, you know, like, we call it kind, specific and helpful feedback rather than just writing on there like, good job, Cal, love the pictures. They're like, oh, I loved how you use, um, you know, contrast and things like that. So this is how we kick off our year. Our students um, present their learning from a project that they've done in a previous year to all of our teachers, all 500 of them when they come back at the year. We've done this now two years in a row. So some good pictures of that. Telling that story, here's a story at some um, at the board meeting. Again, you've got a very public audience that's happening there. Got some other CISA one friends that they're telling their story to um, and, and answering questions. I think one of the, the big pieces too is when you think about students being able to talk within their own journey of where a project is going. These are first graders who are talking to some visitors about their project pathway. So those kids know. They know what the milestones are. They know what the end goal is. They know that they're going to end up creating a podcast. They know that from day one of the project all the way through, you know, the six week or the end milestone. So they're able to explain that pathway of how they're being assessed, why they're being assessed, why it's important to get feedback, and then ultimately what their product is at the end. We've focus a lot of energy and effort and try to change not only culture within our own staff, but um, also within the public is the idea of a public demonstration of learning is about the process. It's not just about the finished product. So having a student be reflective as how they got from point A to point B and moved along the way is ultra important. Not just that everybody, we just call them widgets. Not that everybody made the widget at the end, but how were they able to talk about their personal growth, their own reflection, what milestones they put together and building blocks they put together in order for them to get to uh, that, that end point. So cool stuff, I got a bunch of pictures here. Um, you know, here's another, um, I got another screenshot. Sometimes my internet's a little slow. So, um, 
you know, here's some recipes that we did with that, uh, the Big Deal Burgers product, which was our ice cream flavor, um, using some, some of the questions and some of the rubrics from Define Learning, if it ever loads up here. Um, but talking about this prices and profits down there at the bottom for us is huge because we were like, well, what happens if you put a cup of pecans into an ice cream versus a half cup? How does that change your profit margin? And they're learning that. And then they're like, oh, now we got to convert it from fractions to decimals and multiply it if they sell 200 gallons a day versus 50 gallons a day. And there's a ton of math behind that when at the surface, it just looks like this really cool food project where you're designing an ice cream flavor. Um, so again, just that idea of learning is public. I have a whole bunch of samples here. Um, we rent out spaces in our local farmer's market for kids to present because that's a big draw for us within the community. Um, we've got kids building cardboard boats, which is amazing. Um, we have student led businesses that we've started in kind of a shark tank style format. We have, we do actually have a, um, live bee nest and be um, like honey or not honeycombs. Um, we have a bee business that actually has hundreds of thousands of bees. They harvest about 40 gallons of honey every year and sell that in their business. Um, we've built little, little lending libraries. I got all sorts of stuff on here. We looked at the freelance artist project within Define Learning and kind of adapted and took that and made murals within the school talking about how artists bring their own um, their own social identity and how that impacts people's work. So this is a mural that was created by a group of people at one of our middle schools that's displayed in the hallway. So tons of different projects. Um, we've built plastic reefs, all sorts of stuff, just super cool stuff. Um, all with that idea of like, this is the final product, but when students are having their presentations of learning, it's about the iteration, it's about the reflection, they're bringing the content knowledge and adding that in here. Like, as you can see, stained, gla stained glass algebra, like you can see some of the samples down there. Like they had to calculate all of the, you know, let's lay an X, Y coordinate on there. And they had to calculate all those lines and everything, but it's through the project. It wasn't just like, let's learn an hours with algebra. And then we have a half hour PBL time at the end. So that, that integration that um, Cindy was talking about at the beginning um, is super crucial to, to where we see success. Thanks, Adam. Do you want to talk a little bit about, before I share my screen, any um, tidbits on your professional learning uh, goals with this and how you, you know, change sort of, or help the educators along with project-based learning and define? Yeah. yeah. So, um, and I saw a couple of questions that I can answer in there too. So um, I think one of the pieces for us for for um, especially in partnership with Defined is we've had people go through the leadership track um, in some of the PD modules. There's always like the asynchronous pieces that are in there as well. So that's been really important to give people time um, within um, Defined to like explore that. That's been super important for us. I'm always a partner as well as I'm going in and like digging through like projects because you'll see some of them like can layer on top of each other and things like that. So that's been um, a big support for us. And I saw one of the questions was like, where do you guys give your people some space and some permission? Um, in, in our own internal professional development, we have um, what's called micro credentials. So it's professional learning. The first thing that I tell people in that class is, as I've taught it for like five years, is your first project's going to be rough. It's um, it's it's an iterative process for us as adults too. You're going to find, you know, you might go to Defined and find a project that you really like, and you might run with that the first year, and then you're like, the second year when you come back, you're like, yeah, I'm going to do the same project, and then you're like, but I got so much more things that I could offer to the project as they, you know, nerves creep in. That's just human, um, just human nature. But, and the second thing that I do when I, when I support people is I give them my cell phone number. I'm like, text me if you want, I'll come and co-teach with you. I'll come and plan with you. I'll come and walk right there with you. Um, so that kind of like lets some people breathe a little bit. I think also when I look at like the, the projects when I was talking before about like the rubrics are there, some of the writing prompts are there. They don't have to worry about those pieces. 
it's already there for them and they can worry about building the capacity in their students because that's the dynamic piece of their classroom. They can focus on the pieces in their classroom community around how do I um, how do I build collaboration? How do I build appropriate communication between students? How am I going to teach students what kind, specific, and helpful feedback is? How do I teach kids in kindergarten what elbow partners are? How do I teach kids how to do a think pair share and be respectful of other people's opinions? So um, that frees up all of those pieces where we could focus on building the community in the classroom. Um, and not have to worry about those other pieces. So I think that's a good first step for us. Like I said, you know, my constant things that I'm harping on is, is the learn, do you have a classroom community where learning is iterative? Do you have a classroom community where like high quality work is valued and is learning public? If you can build those three things within your classroom community, that, that has like not a lot to do with project-based learning. It has a lot to do with good teaching. And even when we have teachers who are nervous about getting into project-based learning, if they build those three things, we could start a project in April if you wanted to. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. Um, I'm happy to just take you know five minutes or so to um, share a little bit more about who we are um, at Defined, and then we'll maybe open it up for other questions. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen um, and hopefully teach you guys all a little bit more about who we are at Defined. So we have three different platforms, um, Defined Learning, which is what we're talking about mostly today, Defined Careers, and then Defined Academy. So Defined Learning is that online library of deeper learning opportunities or PBL units that are um, you know, cross-curricular in nature, aligned to the Wisconsin state standards, and really is that place where we're asking students to apply what they're learning from your classrooms to a real-world authentic situation. So all of the content, whether they're in K all the way up to grade 12, is delivered through the lens of a career. So um, really helping with that student engagement piece and all the great um, high-quality instruction that Adam is talking about. Uh, Define Careers is our second platform. Um, it is really, it is also K-12. It is all about the career experience and career exploration, um, still rooted in project-based learning, getting away from the academic standards and really focusing on the 16 clusters and 79 different pathways. Those triangulate into student portfolios. Um, I'll show you a sample one of those today where you as a district are able to measure and assess student growth over time, whether you're looking at standards, your own learner profiles or profile of graduates, uh, competencies and whatnot, um, all of the careers they've been exposed to, everything will be housed in those student portfolios. And the idea is that, you know, Mary starts in West Dallas and in, in kindergarten and it stays with her um, during the time in, um, at the district. All of those artifacts are housed there. Um, so you're able to also, you know, have access to that as you um, as you move on, and then Defined Academy. Uh, Adam talked a little bit about that. That is part um, all of where we house our professional learning for um, you know PBL. So I'll briefly walk you through. Adam showed you a couple. Um, talked about a couple of different examples: the ice cream maker and the you know um, food truck entrepreneurs. This is the homepage of Defined Learning. So there's hundreds of different. Um, units in here. You can see the course library up top. It is tied to all the core content. Um, if you just, let's click on math, you'll see it is grade banded. Um, so I'm going to click on any grade. I'll click on seventh grade and you'll see um, a de course description, some links to help teachers, and then you'll see the unit outline. So am I teaching something on rational numbers? They could be a baker, a car dealership, a local development planner. I'm going to look at one on geometry. They could be an interior designer, a rain barrel manufacturer, architects. Um, like Cindy says, Dr. Moss always says, you can't be what you can't see, right? This is really to help them um, with that as well. So I won't walk you through all of this, but I'll always decade, get a little introduction and spreading. A tiny house is a residential structure under 400 square feet. So they'll get that little introduction all about being an architect. They'll get a real world connection video answering, you know, why do I have to learn this, the relevance piece. And then 
you, throughout all of the steps of our units, you'll see these opportunities to check in, reflect, you know, here, you know, it's what skills are needed to be an architect, what type of math is needed to be an architect. Um, so they will answer that, you know, the teacher will respond to those. A lot of teachers use that first reflection as more of an exit slip. And then everything we do is tied to the UBD framework. So whether they're in, you know, K or 12, they're going to work through a goal, a role, an audience, a situation, and then ask produce those real world products. Your goal is to help start a tiny house community in or around the area you live. Your role is as a designer, and you will be part of a team of tiny house engineers and architects. You will be informing the public about your new tiny house community, as well as developing a model tiny house. Your audience is the... So you'll see that audience there. They'll get a little more context in their situation like Adam has. You can always tweak the audiences, bring in those local experts. They're going to begin their research. Um, they'll have these open-ended questions to keep in mind. They'll have helpful vocabulary here. They'll have uh, research resources. This is secondary, 6 or 12, taking them outside of defined learning. Published articles already you know, vetted for them on the internet. K-5 will have constructed responses, nonfiction reading, writing opportunities for them. And then the teacher's always going to see a product choice. So more of a menu, two to three products to choose from. Here they could do a scaled floor plan and or a 3D model. Maybe students choose. Um, there is criteria for both of those. You can um, customize this if you want to. Um, down below, I won't walk through everything, but Adam talked a lot about the importance of the rubrics. There's these four-point rubrics, standard space. You can download them, print them, edit them. They'll be there for each one of the products. You'll have those check-ins we talked about, resources, queuing teachers and educators with implements to implementation strategies, materials. It will connect then, uh, you know, with your standards then as well. Um, so that's just one quick sample. I'll show you one more in the computer science and STEM course. This is a brand new offering. Um, it is K-12 as well. You get computer science courses, STEM and society course, an engineering course, and a STEAM course. I'm going to show three through five engineering. So you'll see, again, the description of the course, uh, some links for teachers, including a book catalog, you know, so they can match them up with defined learning projects. I'm going to click on industrial engineer. And so they might be an aquarium designer, a backpack designer. This is one of my favorites about designing a backpack. Again, they'll get that little introduction. The construction has stopped. So. A tool is something used to help us complete a task. We may not think of them as tools, but backpacks are an important tool. People of all ages. So you get the idea. They'll get that railroad connection. Why do I have to learn about this? How am I going to use this? Have those check-in questions. And then they'll get their grasp model here. Your goal is to make a backpack that is better than the backpacks on the market. You will want to make your design stand out by adding a special feature or using a different material. Your role is a lead designer for a company that makes backpacks. Your audience is the marketing team. Since you're working remotely, you they'll get a little more context in their situation. You know, what's the problem or challenge? Why do you think it's a problem or challenge? Begin the research with some great open-end questions to keep in mind, helpful vocabulary. Um, this is an example of that nonfiction reading and writing opportunity in a three through five um, constructed response. They can download that, print that, that can be read to them. And then they're going to answer, you know, explain how backpacks are designed to meet a variety of purposes. And then you'll see a product choice here is they could design a blueprint, build a prototype or create an infomercial. Um, they could do all three, you know, they could just do one. It's really flexible in its implementation. And then of course, everything is summed up in text below with those rubrics. I had mentioned um, portfolios. So the idea is that every student is creating a student portfolio. So this is a sample fictitious student. All of their artifacts, you know, are in their portfolio. So I was a forensic entomologist, a food science technician, a kernel game designer. You get the idea. As they get older, this becomes more robust if they wish. You could add personal um, items, anything they're proud of, ACT scores, resumes, et cetera. Um, and then when you click on the plans button, this is where we have our own defined portrait of a graduate, right? Where we're looking at career readiness and you know the five C's and um, 
critical thinking, expand any of these with our indicators, but districts can also customize this. So we have samples of that. This is, you know, Los Angeles Unified. They're all about self-advocacy, adapt, adaptability with their different um, indicators there. So we can customize rubrics for districts so you can measure that porch of a graduate, um, you know, to meet your needs. So I'm going to stop now. Questions and, you know, for Adam, Cindy, or myself, um, I was going to put my little information in there as well. So you can reach out to me if you'd like to learn more or schedule a meeting. Questions, comments? Did we get to all the questions, Cindy? Yes. We're good. Great. And we'd like you guys to know, like Adam is doing incredible work. But if you just are ready to get started, you want to take that first step, we would love to help you move in the right direction. And if you're already doing it, we'd like to help you uh, expand what you're doing. So oh, and I see a question from Kevin. So it is definitely more of a supplement, Kevin. So we would put this, embed this into your units of study, your math, your science. Um, that is typically what works best. Um, but, you know, districts use it in all sorts of different fashions, as you can imagine. A great, great question. Any anybody else? I put a link in there um, with my information, and I know Adam is always lovely. Adam's one of our best Wisconsin partners, so we appreciate all of your innovation and all the hard work you do to engage those students in in West Dallas. They're lucky to have you. Adam, could you please talk to? grading in West Dallas, West Milwaukee, just a little bit. Yeah. Which uh, I, I assume you're doing something beyond the traditional, you know, report card sort of thing, but maybe, you know, just talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So um, in K-5, um, we're standards-based. So we have um, what's called is our student ICANN statements. So um, they're written in parent and student-friendly language. They're kind of broad and overarching. We try to keep it to about 10 to 12 per um, subject area within, so like over the course of a third grader, you've got your core subjects, you've got about 40 to 50 um, different pieces that they're that they're getting graded on. And they're, uh, they're great. We don't have grades, they're mastery, progressing, and not yet. So, um, and they don't grade everyone every, every quarter. It's kind of like whatever you're hitting on is kind of what you're grading on. Um, at the secondary, we do have a, we currently have a traditional grading system. Um, you know, as this has been work that we've been doing since about 2018 and pushing in, um, in this direction and using project-based learning as an instructional model, um, we're starting to actually get people to ask us to to change our grading system to something that's more standards-based. So it's really like a need driven for some of our teachers as you know you're having conversations with the teacher and you're planning a project and they're like oh if i just didn't have to assign a letter grade to this i feel like i could do so much more so we're like oh i'm like oh, tell me more about that like what would that look like and and so it's been um good for us to have some of those conversations so we've had people um piloting and like they have to run two grade reports kind of thing um, so we get a little bit more reporting out in some of our classes that are using um, like that full project-based learning model, if that makes sense. Adam, mm -hmm. what are you doing for your principals? You talked about the teachers and professional development. How do yeah. you help the principals understand you have to be a different kind of leader if you're expecting your teachers to teach in a different manner? Yeah. Yeah, so um, our a lot of our strategic plan goals, like I'd mentioned, one of our strategic plan goals is that the students are presenting at least two times to an authentic audience every year. Um, a lot of uh, how we kind of get to all of our goals and our like core beliefs is equity through deeper learning. So we use the deeper learning competencies, which is you know very much embedded in like the Hewlett Foundation and a lot of other work around the country now. Um, and so like when you talk about grading, Kevin, like we've had people say, well, wouldn't we just like kind of grade on the deeper learning competencies of what does an effective communicator look like, an effective collaborator and some of those personal and soft skills. Um, so what we've done for principals is in the summer, we host a lot of workshops um, and do a lot of like professional development around what are those deeper learning competencies look like. 
um, in our classrooms and what is student, like what is evidence of co-creating with students look like? I was telling um, Mary and Cindy as we were having some pre-calls, I think one of the coolest moments for me, I used to be like a school-based leader. So I was in charge of um, five of our schools and I've been with a partner with one school for uh, this would have, this would be my sixth year. And we had students this summer. So the teachers were working on their, on designing their projects and um, the kids act, and parents came in and they did a tuning protocol with the kids and parents on what they would want to see as outcomes for their student and what they would want to see, uh, what they were going to be doing in their project. So it was like the second day back of like our welcome back teachers, they brought in like seven third graders, a bunch of fourth and fifth graders, a bunch of 4K, 5K parents. And just like we run tuning protocols in our staff meetings, they presented the project. Here's the standards that we're gonna address. Here's how we're gonna address them. Here's how your child's gonna be assessed. Here's the long-term goal. And then the, they ask the kids for feedback on specific things. We run that same cycle in our staff meetings um, very, very frequently um, when we're doing like project design and, and what that looks like. I love so we're, we're using some summer pieces. Um, I am in my role too. I'm working with leadership teams to look at like, what, what do, what is project-based learning? Like, what are we looking for? And we have people who are, who are all over in the journey. You know, we have people who are their year ones. We have people who are year five. So when we talk about, I was talking before about like micro PBL steps, we look for things in the learning community, like are they giving, are students giving feedback to each other that's purposeful, that's mm -hmm. kind, and that's helpful and specific? Is learning iterative? And um, is the learning public? When I walk into a classroom, like what's on the walls? Um, what am, what are, are students grabbing my hand and asking me to go and see something that they just created last week? I think those are the learning environments you know, where we see a lot of the growth. And sometimes too, when I'm, I was just coaching two teachers yesterday um, in a project and they were kind of explaining a project. Um, some, it was one of the plants and animal design habitat projects. And they were like, oh yeah, you know, they did that one and they're explaining it and they're like lighting up and like, we want to do something this year, but we want to go bigger. We want to partner with like the Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewage District and we want to have this. And I'm watching them like light up and then I'm like, okay, you know, that's cool. Like, what are we going to, what, what else is on tap for this year? And they're like, well, we, we got to cover like standards X, Y, Z and their whole demeanor just changed. So I also am looking at the teacher on like, how are they bringing their passion into the classroom? And that's where like, you have a ton of projects within Define where like, it's very similar standards, but there's so many different ways to approach it and get to that, that same point. It's like, if our standards are, you know, I always joke with my high school friends. I'm like, uh, if the standard is teaching writing, who cares if it's typed, written on pink paper, on a napkin, on toilet paper? We're assessing a student's ability to tell a narrative story. We're not assessing the student's ability as to how they are going to do it. Or what that final product would look like, I guess, would be a better, a better descriptor of that. And I think too, um, Cindy, you had thrown in the chat about some of the literacy pieces. This has been um, a, a more focus for us is just using our core curricular resources that we've had or that we have. And how are those pieces, like how are we using our reading databases within our scholastic libraries that if a teacher is doing, um, you know, like a teacher's doing this food truck project, how are they reading about the importance of food in different societies around the world? How are they reading about how the access to natural resources impact communities and their ability to like have access to fresh food? So they're like looking for those pieces of how are they weaving in some of those things versus like, okay, resource X tells me I have to read this passage. So we all have to read this passage and then we're gonna read another passage that has to do with our project. We're like, no, throw out that passage and, and read the one that actually has to do with your project. And um, people are like, like, they get excited about that because then it's not another thing on the plate and it's not the PBL time. It's teaching through the standards. 
I love it. And Cindy, you said that before. I mean, it's important to give permission to do that, right? And educators need to, you know, need that permission. Um, that's amazing, Adam. Yeah, yeah. I I also consider myself a non-threatening person when I when I go into somebody's classroom. Like I'm right there on the rug with the kids. Yeah. People, you know, like yesterday I was joking. I was like, I oh, mean, I picked the worst day to fill in on some lunches. You know, us Wisconsin people, it was pouring rain all day. Yeah. And yesterday in our district, it was French toast sticks and syrup. Oh, and yeah. so I was in three different elementary schools and, you know, it's just like you're ripping open those syrup packets and it's, 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 an, it's an, it makes for an interesting time. <laughs> That's for sure. Any, any other comments, questions, feedback? I think Kevin wants to come visit your district, Adam. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Just reach it. out. I, I put my email in the chat. Yeah. Thanks so much, everybody. We all want to, Jennifer. Yeah. yeah. Let's do it. Let's have a field trip. Thanks so much, Adam, for sharing right. your wealth of knowledge and inspiring everybody. Thanks, Cindy, for setting the stage for us. Good, Amy, good to see you. And and I put my email there, too, if anybody wants to get in further touch. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.